بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم. We left off in God's emissaries talking about Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam when he went back to the king and uh, told the king interpretation of the dream. And then the king wanted to, he sent the interpretation and now the king wanted him to come back. He wanted him to come back to the palace and meet him. But uh, Yusuf alayhi salam wanted to be exonerated first before that. So he told the people, the cup bearer, which was his friend that, uh, remember he interpreted two people's dreams. One of them died, one of them lived and went and served the king. So he told that guy who lived, go back to the king and, and I don't want to come until you settle this thing. Asked him about the women who cut their hands. And uh, he, the king asked the people, you know, about the women who tried to seduce him, Yusuf, alayhi salam. And they said that we cannot blame Yusuf for anything. And uh, that the truth has surfaced and that uh, we were the ones who tried to seduce him. And Yusuf was telling the truth. So he cleared his name. And uh, three days after Jibra'il had promised Yusuf, the messenger would return to have him freed. So the messenger asked Yusuf why he insisted on going the way he did. Most people would just want to get out of jail. You know, why did you insist that you wanted to have your name cleared? He said, I did all this so the Aziz would know that I did not betray him in his absence and that Allah does not guide the traitor's tricks. <clears throat> so we left off at this uh, part. So it says the cupbearer brought Yusuf to the court before presenting him to the king. He entered by himself and recounted for him Yusuf's wise words. The king uh, wanted to meet the, the person who was so wise, who spoke uh, all these things and said, bring him to me. I want to appoint him to my personal service. So when he was brought before him, he spoke with him at length about the dream that he had and all the implications of these dreams. And he told him, as of today, you hold in our eyes a place of eminence and you have our complete trust. So this is what the king has told Yusuf. Yusuf said, appoint me to oversee the uh, granaries of this land for I am prudent with whatever is placed in my care and knowledgeable of the administration of this program and of the languages spoken by your subjects. It's uh, <clears throat> ayat and Quran and uh, also narration. So Yusuf, ayat 55. And he says, Yusuf was not, you know, boastful to uh, come, you know, and uh, say, I am... You know, we have some people that come and they say like all of their qualifications every time they go anywhere around anyone. They say, uh, and no one even asks, you know, and they just say, I, I have this degree and that degree and I am this type of profession and that type of profession and I have done this for this time and that time. And, you know, like to try to make themselves feel very important. Yusuf was not like this. But sometimes you need to tell your credentials in order to show that you are qualified. If you're going for a job, for example, you need to tell them what you're capable of and what you've done and things like this. So uh, Yusuf wasn't doing it in a boastful way, but he, he said it says it was critical for the welfare of Egyptian people that a qualified individual assumed that big role. Uh, so he let his abilities be known to the extent that was necessary to get the job. The king easily accepted this uh, request and gave Yusuf the title of Aziz, or the Minister of Agriculture and Food, Food Distribution, if we can look at it in today's term. And he consigned to him his ring and his silver goblet, which was the standard of measure in the kingdom. Of these rings, they had a seal on them. Uh, this is uh, why we, the word khatam is for ring and also is a word for seal because the seal used to be on the ring and the people would uh, stamp with the, the ring. So he had this ring and he had uh, uh, the, the things he needed to uh, this ring and silver goblet, which was the measure of that uh, position. 
So Allah established Yusuf in that land where he once was a slave. Remember, he was in the well when they bought him and sold him. He could uh, now he could move around freely wherever he wanted to. Even before he was a slave, and then he was a prisoner. And Allah delivers, you know, by His mercy, whoever He wants, and He doesn't forsake those people. He rewards those who do good. We have trust in Allah. Allah will take care of us. We see that about this uh, in the book Kamal al-Din. Uh, by Sheikh al-Saduq, rahmatullah alayhi, we have narration from Imam Bakr alayhi salam. It says, in the master of this affair, speaking of uh, Sahab al-Amr, Imam Zaman, the master of the time, the Imam of the time, Imam Mahdi, ajallah ta'ala farajahu sharif, he said, in the master of this affair, there is a resemblance to Yusuf alayhi salam. And that is that Allah will improve and reform his affairs overnight. Allah reformed the situation of Yusuf overnight by causing the king to have a dream. Yusuf was in a prison. He was in prison and he, he went from prison. The next, you know, right after this, the king had a dream and his whole situation changed overnight. And Allah will reform the affairs of Imam Zaman, Imam Mahdi, Ajallah Ta'ala Farajul Sharif, in one night by gathering his companions from faraway lands. It will also take place very quickly, like this. So, for the next seven years, Yusuf uh, he issued a, uh, an order, a mandate. He said all the wheat farmers to sell all their surplus wheat to the king's treasuries at the fair market value. In this way, Yusuf gave the farmers an incentive to produce more and to honestly disclose their surplus. He had acres of uh, massive gran uh, granaries constructed in which they stored the whole ears of wheat, dried but otherwise unprocessed, it says, just as Allah instructed them in the king's dream. As he acquired seven years worth of grain, he nearly, completed, he nearly completely depleted the king's treasuries but with good cause. At the end of the seven years, when the famine struck, Yusuf, on behalf of the king, held a monopoly over most of the, the commodity, the, the most needed thing by every Egyptian was wheat. And he proceeded to sell it back to them at a reasonable price and according to an equitable system of rations, thereby deflecting the brunt of the famine. So through these measures, these wise ways, uh, Yusuf was uh, able to combat that famine. And he says, as families' personal food stores were depleted, they began uh, coming to Egypt to buy their rations, expecting to have to fight for these things through a corrupt system. The people were pleasantly surprised to find an efficient and equitable system in place that left no Egyptian without sufficient rations. We are taught by, uh, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to hoard things, you know, to wait till the people need them and then charge them more for those things because there's a demand for those things. For example, if we store all the flour and then when people need it, we sell it for three times the price of the, you know, that it's worth. We shouldn't do these things. This is not fair. It's not just. Uh, so we see that people were expecting this. Unfortunately, in many uh, the countries around the world, all over the place, we see that there's a lot of corruption in government, corruption in the way things are distributed, uh, a lot of these things. So they were expecting this. I'm going to have to uh, fight, you know, for, uh, you know, what we want for the rations. But when they came to Yusuf, they found uh, Yusuf to be just and fair, and they were pleased with the way that things were going for the rations. So Yaqub gathered his sons and he told them, it has reached me that good wheat is still sold in Egypt, and the man in charge of it is a righteous man who does not withhold from people what is due to them. Yaqub, alayhi salam, Jacob, he is telling his sons that Yusuf, alayhi salam, is just, He's not knowing that it's Yusuf at this point, but he's saying this man, who is Yusuf, is just. He treats people fairly. 
He's not greedy. He's not stingy with things. Uh, Yusuf controlled the food supply for the king, you know, when he was released from this prison. When the seven years of famine hit, he made sure that everybody had something fair, a fair share of food and was just. If it had been a corrupt system, for example, a uh, few would have eaten very well while the rest of the people would have went without and they would have starved. So we see in some countries, the government controls 80% of the wealth and the other people live off of the 20%. This is how it might have uh, went if Yusuf was not there. Uh, <clears throat> in the time of Imam Mahdi, alayhi salam, he will bring justice. It will bring equity to what before was corrupt society and uh, where they had unfair wealth distribution. So it said in that time, no one will be in need during the government of the imam. So much so that people will need to pay their zakat that they have, but they won't find anyone in need to give it to that can receive it. Subhanallah. Inshallah, we all see the time of uh, Imam Mahdi's rule and government, and we can help him in these affairs. Uh, you know, sometimes we feel that if we give uh, to people, that we will become poor. And this is a trick from shaitan. It's mentioned in Quran, Surah 2, Surah Baqarah, Ayat 268. Shaitan threatens you with poverty and orders you to immorality, while Allah promises you forgiveness from him and bounty, and Allah is all-encompassing and knowing. So we also see something very interesting in the narrations, that if you're seeking more, that you should actually give away from what you have first. Imam Ali alayhi salam said, if you want to pray to the Lord for better and uh, better means of sustenance, then first give something in tzedakah, give some charity. We see that uh, that's the key. We would think normally, I don't have anything. You want me to give something and I need something. No, it says give away from what you have and ask Allah to give you more. This is the key to getting uh, more sustenance. We look, look at the life of Imam Hassan al-Mushtaba alayhi salam. It says that he gave his whole entirety of wealth away several times during his lifetime. And the money came back. He gave away all his wealth. His wealth came back. He gave away his wealth. Wealth came back. Imam Hassan alayhi salam, as the rest of the imams were, were known, they were very generous. So Yaqub tells his sons, go to this man who is Yusuf and buy wheat from him. He will be good to you, inshallah. The caravan from Canaan uh, traveled for 18 days, bringing Yusuf's 10 older brothers to Egypt. They appeared before Yusuf <clears throat> and he immediately recognized them. Yusuf recognized his brothers, but they failed to recognize him because Allah prevented them from doing so through supernatural means. This is also similar to the situation of our 12th Imam, Ajallah Ta'ala Faraju Sharif. And a reason why Imam Mahdi السلام, is called or referred to as Yusuf of Zahra, the Yusuf of Zahra, because uh, Yusuf was in Ghaiba, where he, in, in occultation or concealment, where he fully knew who everyone was. But even his own brothers, his own blood brothers, didn't recognize who he was. Imam Mahdi, السلام, he lives amongst us. He's active with the affairs of the people, with the affairs of his Shia, yet we don't recognize him. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam has a very interesting narration that in regards to Imam Mahdi and Yusuf alayhi salam. It's very strong narration in words because he is rebuking people who are denying the Imam, who will come and deny the Imam in that time. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, he says, the community who is resembling pigs, opposes the belief in occultation or ghaybah of the Qa'im, Imam Mahdi, from the progeny of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Indeed, the brothers of Yusuf were descendants of the prophets. They interacted with Yusuf and they closed the deal with him, but they didn't recognize him until he introduced himself. 
then how do these cursed people question the ability of Allah to conceal his proof from people wherever he likes? Imam is telling this in his narration, that these people who are denying the, the Imam of our time, the 12th Imam, they are cursed. And he is saying that, how can they deny this when this has already happened before with Yusuf? Indeed, Yusuf was emperor of Egypt, and there was a distance of 18 days travel from Egypt to the house of Yaqub. If Allah desired, he could have made the whereabouts of Yusuf known to Yaqub. By Allah, after receiving the good news, uh, Yaqub and his sons reached Egypt in just nine days. Then how do these people say that Allah cannot repeat the process with his last hujjah, his last proof? Imam says, Yusuf used to move about in the markets. He sat among the people, but they didn't recognize him until the Almighty permitted and until Yusuf said, do you know how you treated Yusuf and his brother when you were ignorant? So this is what Imam says, the relation between Yusuf and Imam Mahdi, alayhi salam. This narration is mentioned by Alama Majlisi, in Hayatul Qulub, Volume 1. So we see that Allah concealed the identity of Yusuf to his brothers, even though he knew who they were. And we see that Allah, in the same way, in similar fashion, is concealing the identity of Imam Zaman, Ajallah Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif, until he reveals himself to the people. He recognizes us where we don't recognize him. In one of the uh, mujtahideen, they told me a uh, long time ago, they said, be careful of, of how you treat people. Because imagine if someone came to you and you treated them bad and you found out later that person could have been the imam and you didn't know. Or he could have been someone close to the imam, could have been a supporter of the imam and you treated them bad. Imagine that. Imagine the imam come to you. And you don't know. This is, we have many stories of this happening. They realize after the fact that the imam has helped them. And that was the imam, but they didn't know at the time. Imagine we treated the imam bad. So we have to always treat people fair. Always treat people just. And treat people good no matter who they are. If they are poor or if they are rich or they are black or they are white or they are whatever. We have to treat all people uh, justly and fairly. So <clears throat> he says that he prevented uh, his uh, aware his um, his uh, who he was by supernatural means, and then he says he attended to them before the others in the Canaan uh, Canaanite caravan and asked them, "Who are you?" So the the sons of Yaqub or Yusuf's brothers, they said. We are the children of Yaqub, the son of Ishaq, son of Ibrahim, the all-merciful's friend when, who Nimrud uh, threw into the fire, but he did not burn. Rather, Allah made the fire cool and peaceful for him. Yusuf said, then according to you, three prophets bore you, yet none of you appears to be a wise man, nor any of you are dignified or humble. Perhaps you were actually spies sent by some other king to my country. So they replied, O oh, Aziz, we are not spies or warriors. If you knew our father, you would like us. For he is a prophet of God and a descendant of prophets, and he is very sad. Yusuf said, Why is he sad if he is a prophet of God and a descendant of prophets? And paradise is his final resting place. He has sons as numerous and as strong as you. Perhaps he is sad because of your foolishness or ignorance or your lies or tricks or deception. They said, oh, Aziz, we are not fools. His sadness is not because of us. Rather, he had a son named Yusuf who was younger than us. He went hunting with us and he was eaten by a wolf. Ever since, our father has been miserably sad and tearful. Yusuf told them, are all of you from one father? They said, our father is one, but our mothers are different. He said, then what drove your father to send all of you on this trip without keeping even one of you behind to bring himself comfort and peace of mind? They said he did. He kept one of us behind. 
He's the youngest of us. And he said, why did he choose him out of all of you? They said, because he is the most beloved of us after Yusuf. <clears throat> satisfied, Yusuf was satisfied that he made enough of a pretense of suspicion to prevent them from discovering his identity. He didn't want them to know, find out who he was. So Yusuf told them he was satisfied with their answers. He believed their story. He told his servants to take care of their needs and uh, show them great hospitality. So the rations were given out based on the number of people that were in the house. So the brothers explained to Yusuf that they needed 10 rations for themselves, two for their parents, one for their half brother, in addition to their servants. Yusuf told them that he would provide them with everything they needed, including their absent brother. So they paid the price for their uh, rations of wheat and Yusuf ordered his workers to begin filling up their saddlebags with their rations. Then he said to them, bring me this half brother of yours next time you come. Do you not see that I give you your full portion and I am most gracious host to you? Uh, but he sensed that, you know, this alone might not be enough to bring them, uh, have them bring uh, Benjamin, or he said Benjamin in Arabic. So Benjamin, he, so he added, if you don't bring your half brother to me next time, you won't get any more rations from me and you won't even be able to approach me. So he made a very strong condition that they needed to bring Benjamin back to the Aziz, which was Yusuf. They so said, we'll try to persuade, you know, our father to let him come and uh, still not convinced that they would do as he told them. He, Yusuf, discreetly ordered the servants, pray, place the thing that they paid us, they paid the frankincense, said, put that back into their bags. The money, the, the, the items that they bartered for their uh, rations, put it back in their bag. Hopefully, they will recognize it when they get back to their family, and they will return to me once more, this time with my brother, Benjamin. So when they returned back to Yaqub, they told him all about the journey they went on, how the king was just. Uh, however, they said, uh, next time, we're not going to get any rations at all if we don't take Benjamin with us. Uh, so we send him with us. When, so send him with us when we go for our rations and we will protect him. So Yaqub is like, how can I possibly give Benjamin to you? Uh, to take care of them. And I entrusted his brother Yusuf to you before. And look what you did with Yusuf. So he said that their promises hold no weight. They're empty promises. But Allah is the protector. And he is the most merciful. So he agreed to let him go. Uh, but not because he trusted them. But because he trusted in Allah. And he saw that there was no other option for him to do. When they opened their packs, they brought out their wheat that they, they got, and they found the thing, the frankincense that they bartered with in that same uh, bag. It had been returned to them. So <clears throat> they told their father, you know, they were excited to go back to Egypt. They said, Father, what more could we want? Here is our capital that we spent. It has been returned to us, so we shall provide for our family. We can protect our brother. We can increase our provisions by one camel load. And it's easily uh, attainable if we go with Benjamin. So six months later, they went to their stores. Uh, when their stores had nearly been depleted, <clears throat> Yaqub's son prepared another caravan uh, go to Egypt. And this time they got Benjamin. But Yaqub was still you know, worried about the trustworthiness of his sons. And he said, I will not send him with you until you swear an oath to me before Allah that you will bring him back to me unless you are destroyed. So they agreed to this uh, condition. And uh, even though they had ill will towards Benjamin, they wanted to get their father's trust back. So when they swore the oath, Yaqub said, Allah is witness to what we have said. My sons, when you go to Egypt, don't enter all together from a single gate. Rather, enter from different gates so that you don't raise suspicions. He was concerned that uh, they would see 11 strong men entering the city 
and they might uh, get a bit intimidated or might think something that they were coming to do something bad. So he said, nonetheless, I cannot avail you of anything against Allah's wish for such decisions are only for Allah to make. Thus I trust in him for it is in him that people must trust. So we do all that we can, but it, we also have to place our trust in Allah. We do like we say, trust in Allah, but tie our camel. So we, we trust in Allah. For example, we are getting in a car. We trust in Allah, but we also put our seatbelt on. We trust in Allah, but we also lock our door to our house in case someone breaks in our house. So we trust in Allah and we do a little bit that we can also to protect us. So he did what he could. He made them take an oath and then he put his, he has his absolute trust in Allah. So they departed, the, but separated themselves when they got to the city. They entered the city like their father Yaqub told them and went in different gates, uh, small groups. But his uh, advice didn't help them against Allah's wish. Uh, though it did fulfill a need for prudence in Yaqub's heart, Yaqub possessed the knowledge that prudence, uh, while necessary, can thwart Allah's will, cannot thwart Allah's will. He had this knowledge by virtue of what Allah had taught him, for most people do not have this type of knowledge. So once again, all the brothers of Yusuf are back in uh, Egypt. And they came before Yusuf. They still didn't recognize him except as the Aziz. Yusuf showed them special favor again, invited them to join him for a meal. He had several food laid out for them and he asked them to sit in groups with their full brothers. When they were all seated, they saw that one brother, Benjamin, was slept standing. So he asked him, why have you not sat down at the table? Benjamin said, I don't have a full brother amongst them. So Yusuf pressed. He said, do you have a full brother at all? Yusuf said, uh, Benjamin said, yes, I do have a full brother. But they claim he was eaten by a wolf. But I believe they caused some sort of mischief to separate him from our mother and father. Yusuf said, have you married? Do you have children? Benjamin said, yes, Allah has given me three sons. And I have named each of them something to remind me of my lost brother. Yusuf said, uh, I see that you have embraced a woman and had children despite your brother's loss, as though uh, true grief for a brother, you know, should have prevented him from marrying or something like this. But Benjamin told him something interesting to justify his position of why he married, even though he was grieving his brother. He said, I have a good father. <clears throat> Uh, he told me to marry in hopes that Allah would bring forth from my loins children who would fill the world with his praise. So we see that it's recommended uh, to have children and that we teach them to praise Allah and to be good believers. We see from one dua that's mentioned, uh, a dua from Ibrahim alayhi salam, mentioned in Quran. In Surah Ibrahim, ayat 40, we see we say, Rabbijalni Mukima Salata Women Do Riati Rabana wa Takabal Dua. My Lord, make me of those people who establish Salat, and from my descendants, our Lord, and accept my supplication. So Ibrahim is saying from his descendants, he pray, he prays and asks Allah to make them establishers of Salat. So we see that it is very good to, it's uh, recommended to have children and to teach them and be good believers and have more believers in the earth. So Benjamin was set left standing. So Yusuf told him, you come sit with me and my uh, spread. And we say like the sufra that we have on the floor with the food. So Yusuf told him, everyone was busy. Uh, Yusuf told him that to sit with me. He said, everyone was busy eating and Yusuf felt like he could speak privately with Benjamin. So he told him, I wish to be your brother to replace the one that you lost. Benjamin told him, who could ask for a better brother than you? But uh, you are not the son of Yaqub and uh, Rachel. So Yusuf uh, started tearing up and he drew close to Benjamin and told him secretly 
He said, I am in fact your brother and I will protect you. So don't fret over what they used to do to us. This is Surah Yusuf, ayat 69. So Benjamin took the news good. He was happy and he didn't want to raise uh, his other brother's suspicion, but he was excited to have found his brother and relieved of the prospect of, you know, uh, he could escape the constant torments of his older brothers. So he told him, I will never leave your side. He didn't want to leave Yusuf after he found him. So Yusuf finds a way to keep Benjamin there. Yusuf said, I can only keep you here if I accuse you of something awful. So Benjamin said, I don't care. You can do what you must. So Yusuf told him, I have ordered my uh, servants to plant the king's goblet in your saddlebags. Then I will accuse you of sealing them to keep you here with me. So the meal was complete and Yusuf's workers informed him of uh, that the guest rations were all packed and ready to be taken. So they, you know, they, uh, they also let him know that they had acted on his instruction and they also put that goblet in his youngest brother's uh, bag. So Yusuf said bye to all of them, send regards to their father, which was his father, Yaqub. The caravan didn't go far when Yusuf made an alarm and they sent out some soldiers and went and looked for that uh, goblet. So he said, whoever brings me this goblet, receive a camel load of rations. So the soldiers uh, came and said, oh, people, you, are, you have stolen. You, maybe you are thieves. The brothers asked and they turned toward the source of the accusation and said, what, what are you missing? So Yusuf soldier said, we're missing the king's goblet. The brother said, for Allah's sake, you had determined that we did not come here to cause mischief in this land and we are not thieves. Uh, nonetheless, the soldiers wanted to bring the entire caravan back to Egypt so that the Aziz could make decision what to do. So when they were brought back before Yusuf, they denied the accusations. Yusuf challenged them, said, perhaps you're telling the truth. However, what will be the consequence for stealing if you are lying? If we find out that you actually did steal, what will be the consequence? They said, its, its consequence shall be that in whoever bag that it is found, uh, that person will remain with you. This is how we punish wrongdoers in Canaan, where they were from. So they were confident that they were innocent. So they boldly made this offer, even though it could contradict their father's oath. Remember, they promised their father, Yaqub, they wouldn't go back in, in, without Benjamin unless they were all destroyed. So basically, they would not return with him. They would uh, rather be destroyed than go back empty handed. So Yusuf accepted this proposal. They searched the brother's bags. Then they searched Benjamin's bag. They brought it out from Benjamin's bag. And then they changed their tune. The brothers changed their tune. And they said, if he has stolen today, it's no surprise for a brother of his has stolen something before. <clears throat> They wanted to distance themselves from Benjamin and Yusuf by rehashing and bringing up their all. In the beginning of this, we talked about Yusuf's aunt made a false accusation against Yusuf many years before, and then Yusuf had to go stay with her. So they were trying to distance themselves from Benjamin and Yusuf, saying the other brother stole something before. So uh, Yusuf bore their accusations, and he didn't expose the truth to them. He simply said to them, your current predicament is worse than your two brothers, for you have just contradicted your own previous claim that you are not thieves. Now you're admitting that two of you, in fact, are thieves and that you had prior knowledge of this. He's saying before you said, we are not thieves at all. We don't steal. Now you're admitting and saying, oh, your other brother stole something before and you already knew this. This is even worse. So... Yusuf shook his head and he said, Allah knows better whether what you allege about your brother is even true. They lied to him despite his inordinate hospitality, uh, his kindness to them. They still lied to him and they put their current accusation against their lost brother under question. So in this way, Yusuf succeeded with Allah's help in keeping his brother Benjamin in Egypt under the pretext of him having stolen. 
If it had not been for Allah's special favor, he would not have even been able to do so within the, the uh, laws of the king's customs, for it allowed such severe punishment only if the criminal himself agreed to it, in which this case he had agreed to it, because they said if we find it in someone's bag, that person will stay with you. <coughs> so they found it in Benjamin's bag, so Benjamin was to stay. <clears throat> then they realized that the extent of what they have done, because they they said we, he can stay if he gets caught, whoever gets caught with it. Then they realized they'll have to face their father, Yaakub, having broken their oath to him, because they said that we will not return without Benjamin unless we are destroyed. Remember, they went with Yusuf, and they came back without Yusuf. Now they went with Benjamin, and they have to go back without Benjamin. They don't want to face their father, and they swore an oath. So they begged Yusuf and they said, uh, Ya Aziz, uh, he has an old father. So take one of us instead, and we believe you to be among the righteous. Yusuf said, Allah forbid that we take anyone but with whom we found our property. If we were to do so, then we would be wrongdoers to punish someone else for something that he didn't do in his place. So when they lost hope in convincing him to take one of them in his place, they met privately. And the eldest of them, Reuben, said, Do you not remember that our father made us swear an oath before Allah that we would bring our brother back to him unless we were, we were destroyed? And before that, remember how we fell short of our promise with regard to Yusuf. Therefore, I will not leave this land until my father gives me permission or Allah himself ordains a way for me to return. He is the best of us to ordain. So Reuben continued, uh, go back to your father, he told his other brothers, go back to your father and tell him, oh father, your son stole. And we, can we only propose that the thief be taken as punishment for this crime based on our knowledge that we were all innocent. We could have not known the unseen. So nine of them left and they went back, uh, leaving Benjamin behind and they left Reuben behind. And they were worried about what they would do when they had to face their father. So, uh, inshallah, next class, we will pick back up here because we've run out of time. But we will find out what happened when the, brother, when the brothers of Yusuf, the sons of Yaqub, they went back to Yaqub and had to face him without having uh, brought Benjamin back with them. They have uh, violated their oath. And we'll see what took place in that time, uh, inshallah. Salaam